Greenstein's came out, the retail pharmacies of the Walgreens, the CVS's, Young's Pharmacy, they were just having patients lining up and getting vaccinations from the pharmacist. Pharmacists can give vaccinations um, down to kiddos two years of age and up, or three. I don't know. Little, little I try not up. to do the squirmy little kids if I can help it. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're a little noisy. I was at a vaccination clinic a couple weeks ago and they were less excited. More excited about the sucker they got when it was done. But that's a direct patient um, interaction and something you might not think about when you think about what does pharmacy do. Um, another area pharmacy works are what, what are called specialty medications. And specialty medications are usually for a long-term chronic disease and usually very expensive, like more than $10,000 a month. So making sure the patient is taking that medication correctly is having the effect we want from that medication and not side effects. It takes a whole lot more work than here's your regular blood pressure medications and take that continuously. So there's a lot more interaction with the pharmacist for that kind of thing. So what kind of classes in high school and early college help you get into pharmacy school and be a pharmacist? Um, for me, I took as many AP classes as I could in high school, um, except AP Euro because I wasn't a big history person. <laughs> um, I took college credit calculus, so I didn't have to take that in college, which was really nice. Um, I took AP Statistics, so I got out of that in college. Um, and so really in college all I had to do for prereqs were things like Econ 101. Um, I want to say I had to take like an extra psychology class, an anthropology class, so many electives. And a few more chemistry? <laughs> and oh yeah, and some O-chem, some organic <laughs> chemistry, um, and things like that too. Yeah, in high school, I did not take as many AP classes, or the ones that I did take were not really related to pharmacy. Um, I took a lot of AP English, which helped, because then I didn't have to take English at college, um, but I did still have to take general chemistry and organic chemistry. Um, I had to take physics, and I had to take some biology um, in order to be accepted into pharmacy school. There are other um, prerequisites that they have that maybe aren't a science and math based, like Ellie said, econ, psychology, um, things like that. Um, I think taking chemistry in high school helped me more than anything else I did in high school. <laughs> so with, as a parent, I'll say having your student take as many AP classes as possible um, lowers that tuition cost overall for those first couple years, four years, and helps them accelerate the, their career path. Um, six to eight years of school can sound kind of intimidating, especially when you're in the high school. It's like, I just want to be done, I just want to move on. Um, so AP classes do help and are valuable in that way. Um, what would you say your biggest challenges are in pharmacy school or as a new pharmacist? I think as a new pharmacist right now my biggest challenge is kind of trusting myself and trusting that I learned all of the things that I was supposed to learn uh, in pharmacy school and being able to feel independent when I make decisions. I think my biggest challenge in pharmacy school was just staying organized and staying on top of all of my assignments and quizzes and tests. Um, I think especially during the pandemic when we switched to all virtual classes, but hopefully that doesn't happen again for you guys. How about you, Allie? Yeah, I'll kind of echo Allie on the confidence part. Obviously, um, she's a real licensed pharmacist at this point. I am not yet, but hopefully... Another six months. Yes. <laughs> Um, but I would say confidence is a big thing for me, just trusting what I've learned, and then um, 
Also, in pharmacy school, they give you a lot of exams, um, sometimes like three in one week, and they're all on like a month's worth of stuff that you have to cram into your head. So um, that was always a big challenge for me, just deciding what test to prioritize, even though we're literally all in the next few days. Um, and just making up time to study and um, kind of, I don't know, forgetting some of my social life to study. <laughs> but you went to Madison. I, I got that done after the first exam. four years. <laughs> Uh, I would also say it's important to learn how to study. People who you look around you and they're like, oh yeah, I aced that and I didn't even study. Well, that works for about your first two years of college and then you hit your tough classes and you realize you really have no idea how to study. You just could gather it from the lectures and the readings and know it. So if you have any opportunities to develop study habits and a study process, I highly recommend that. Um, another, um, I wrote down something you didn't think would be involved in your job. Um, my job is currently administrative and management. So when I was in pharmacy school and working in the intensive care units, I never thought I'd be right, responsible for writing policies, working with the CDC and the FDA and all the regulatory agencies. So regulations, um, financials, business planning, those are all on the administrative side of pharmacy and we have um, pharmacy leaders throughout the organization who um, look at all the financials of, are we charging enough for the medications? Are the insurance companies paying us for the medications? Did we go through all the insurance processes so it will be paid? So those are things I never thought I would be involved with. Um, I know it's early, but what are some <laughs> things you were surprised that were involved in pharmacy? I think Julia talked a lot about the technology that's involved uh, with pharmacy, um, especially that's how a lot of the nurses on the units get medications to give to our patients. And I think I was surprised by how often I have to help troubleshoot technology issues as a pharmacist so that patients can still continue to receive their medications. Mm -hmm. Anything surprising Any yet? yet? <laughs> um, I don't know if there's anything specifically surprising um, for me being on rotation, but I guess I will say um, just like the different positions that pharmacists can have um, always surprises me. I spent a day with um, a pharmacist who is a drug purchaser last week, and just like the little things that she does to keep this um, hospital pharmacy going. Um, first of all, I never realized or never thought about the fact that someone has to do all these little things. Um, and second, like she does it without making anyone notice. So she fixes all these problems and no one even realizes it's happening. Um, right. But she's a huge part of the pharmacy. Exactly, because we said the nurses scan each medication. Well, if the usual supplier is out, you go to a second supplier, they might have a different barcode, so that all has to be programmed into the system. And then when there's nationwide shortages, you might have heard on um, you know, the news that right now amoxicillin, which is a common for upper respiratory infections, is in short supply. Adderall is in short supply. So it's, do we have alternative sources, or do we put together a document to give physicians alternatives. It's like, okay, we don't have amoxicillin. Here are three other medications that will have the same outcome, and you should be using those instead. So keeping the drugs supplied and in place, I would say that has been like you always hear of supply chain issues. That has been a bigger deal in the last five years than um, previous to that. Um, we also didn't talk about government jobs. 
the Veterans Administration uh, VA hospital system is like the largest employer of pharmacists outside of retail. So working with our veteran populations, also um, pharmacists work within the military for field hospitals and again procurement, but purchasing the medications, getting them where they need to go. Um, the slideshow or the DVD showed a bit about the pharmaceutical industry and that, especially with the genomic um, drugs that are coming out are very targeted to specific patients, specific disease states. So that's another way if you really like genetics but you don't want to be the genetic counselor to tell them they have some horrible genetic disease, you can be on the pharmacy side and come up with a new drug to treat that genetic disease. All right, other comments? Otherwise, we'll open it for questions. Okay. Questions? Yes? What kind of continuing education requirements do you have? Right now, they require 30 hours every two years, so about 15 hours a year. And that can be either reading an article and taking a quiz, attending a live conference and lecture, or um, some kind of hybrid webinar type thing. And um, those are very useful for keeping up to date on regulations and the new medications. Allie was just at a conference. Yes. Yeah, I was at the clinical mid-year meeting um, in Las Vegas last week. So I was going to CE um, talks and also presenting some of my own uh, information and research that I've been working on. What type of research is that? Um, I'm working on piloting a meds to beds or prescription delivery program at Aspire Hospital. So. Um, when patients are ready to go home from the hospital, we fill their medications and bring them to their room and go over everything with them. Um, and we're hoping that it's going to improve patient satisfaction and reduce our readmission rates. Those in Pegasus? Yes. Did you party? No. <laughs> I had no time. <laughs> we kept it pretty busy and on the clock, but there might have been a few social outings. <laughs> Although I assigned, have been. I assigned her to go to one, and she claimed she couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> it was in a large bar, and it was, yeah, yeah, it didn't work. Well, they, yeah, I tried. <laughs> um, yeah, conferences are a great place to see and hear what else is going on in the state, in the country. It's nice to talk to your peers and then find out, oh, you have that problem too. How do you solve it? So while conferences are fun and do have a lot of receptions, um, pharmaceutically enhanced usually, <laughs> at least alcohol, there's um, a lot of good networking that goes on there. Other questions? So no one asked the obvious questions about what's a pharmacist starting salary. So out of, out of school, in a hospital setting, um, right now I would say the starting salary is about $55 an hour. Um, in Walgreens, CVS, right now there is a pharmacist shortage in the retail, so they have $25,000, $50,000 sign-on bonuses in addition to a higher hourly salary than that. So the good thing about that is you should be able to pay off your student loans, which it usually takes to get through. Um, bad thing is it all adds to the cost of health care, and that's, that's tough too. Uh, that we got four minutes left. How do you how do you uh, determine the medication, like the dosage amount? 
like amoxicillin. We know that's a big shortage, right? And most, yeah. probably everyone in here has had that at one time in their life, <coughs> and ear infections, right? Um, so the doctor says, we really want to get amoxicillin. How do you, is it body weight? Is it? So um, all of the above. So first of the, what are we treating? Are we treating an ear infection? Is it a strep throat? Is it pneumonia? So different, different reasons for the medication get different doses. And then, uh, especially in kiddos, body weight. You've seen some 10-year-olds that are teeny tiny, some 10-year-olds that could pass for 18. So looking at the body weight, not just the age. And then making sure both their um, kidneys and their liver are working appropriately. If their kidneys aren't working as well, that means there will be more drug in their body because it leaves through the kidneys, so then they need a lower dose. So we think about all sorts of things. Any other questions? They're fired up today. <laughs> hey, I did not see any hats on the desk, so that's a win for me. Yes. Thank you.